game, a very well orchestrated game. And in Dan's mind, this was a legal case. And he had to destroy me, totally. But I don't know why. Betty Broderick still portrays herself as a victim. I went crazy. I was like this. I have very important things to ask you. You're making me mad. I'll kill you. Elizabeth Broderick stood in their bedroom at the side of their bed. She then took the 38 caliber revolver, pointed it at their sleeping bodies, and unloaded it into them. A lot of this was my fault because I was old and fat and ugly and boring and stupid. The movement that I made into their bedroom woke them up, and they moved, and somebody screamed, called the police, and I said, no, and I just fired the gun. Just, I moved, they moved, the gun went off, and it was like, ah, and it was that fast. I, I never did anything to him to incur all that hate and wrath. I didn't know why they felt so compelled to destroy me. I may leave them alone. I, I would have loved to have done that. And that would have been the plan, is to be left alone and have a million dollar house and a boyfriend and a car and anything, but that's not the truth. Hi, welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Good evening. Tonight's episode, Hell Hath No Fury, the Betty Broderick story. Now this case is probably not new to most of us. I did learn a lot about it this week, and I look forward to a thorough discussion tonight. Now, we should never forget that at the heart of this case is the brutal murder of two people. It was on November 5, 1989, on a quiet Sunday morning, when 46-year-old Daniel Broderick and his 28-year-old wife, Linda, were shot dead in their bed in their Marston Hills home. There was never any other suspect but Dan Broderick's ex-wife, Betty. In fact, there wasn't any other suspect in the case. Um, apparently, Betty went to a friend's house and confessed to her that she had killed her ex-husband and his wife. Well, that's true, yeah. Now, since their 1986 divorce, her behavior had become increasingly erratic and bizarre. Betty would become a national symbol of rage and revenge. But many women saw themselves as Betty. To them, Betty was a hero. So, before we take a deep dive into Hell Hath No Fury... Let's read a couple of five-star reviews and get the beer opened. So our first five-star review comes from Mailman3327, and the title of it is My New Favorite. Move your chair down to the quiet end of the bar, sip the awesome beer that has been reviewed, and listen to a recounting of a true crime. I love the nice slow pace and the way Dick and Jill interact with each other. It's like talking to old friends. Well, that's very nice. I really like that review. It's a good one. I I think so. So, Mailman3327, welcome to the brewery. Thank you, Mailman. Th that was very nice. And our next one, which I really liked, and um, I haven't read to you yet, Dick, because it's it does mention you. It kind of calls you out on something. Called me out. And you know what? It's probably about when we were doing the staircase, and I was ragging on Southerners, North Carolinians in particular. So I'm ready. Give it to me. Okay. So this is from Lore W, and the title is Not From North Carolina. Lore W says, I love this podcast. I think they do a great job on research and in telling the story. I like that they bounce things off of each other and don't always agree. I am so happy I listened to the episodes out of order because if I had listened to The Staircase as my first exposure to the podcast, I would have turned it off when Dick blamed the entire state of North Carolina for the attitudes of a few people he encountered there and then lumped the whole South in a little later. <laughs> I hope he sees how prejudiced that ad attitude is. I am sure Dick would feel the same if after listening to him, I concluded that all pediatricians were dicks. <laughs> That's actually a beautiful play on words. And she's right. I uh, probably overdid it a little bit about my uh, remarks. So I apologize, and I'll try to make sure I, I don't do that again. I like that. So, Laura W., welcome to the brewery. Laura W., I'm glad you were listening and keeping me honest. Welcome to the brewery. So let's see what kind of beer you have here. Do I have a beer for you? So Southern California is kind of the epicenter or one of the epicenters for really good breweries. 
and San Diego in particular has several. The one I chose is called Alesmith Brewing Company, right in the heart of San Diego. And I took one of their flagship beers, Speedway Stout, which is an American double stout. So this style gets some of its inspiration from the Russian Imperial Stout. Many of these double stouts are barrel-aged, either in bourbon or whiskey barrels. Some are infused with coffee or chocolate. Mm. They generally have a pretty high alcohol content. They tend to have cleaner alcohol levels, higher hop levels, and more residual sweetness. Full-bodied with rich roasted flavors. And I can't emphasize the sweetness enough. I think uh, most of the double stouts I've tried have been really sweet. Okay. Like you're eating some milk chocolate and stuff. Wow. So this one in my proverbial snifter glass poured a very dark brown with some red highlights. There was a small tan head. They had coffee, chocolate, and roasty malt aromas. Taste was even better. Really dark chocolate, like espresso, bittersweet and sweet chocolate, and some caramel malt. Mmm, making me thirsty. Oh, try it. So, and it's a very smooth, creamy beer, Um, pretty warming because of the 12% alcohol by volume. So this is a beer to share with a friend. It comes in a 750 milliliter bottle, Uh, probably not for one person to drink. A good sharing beer. And in share we will. There we go. Okay. Well, very good. Very good. Let's take these scruffy vintage old bar stools we've got here down to that slightly dim, quiet end of the bar where we can talk amongst ourselves about the Betty Broderick case. Hell hath no fury. Let's go. Now, in the 1980s, people in San Diego knew who the Brodericks were. With dual degrees from Cornell School of Medicine and Harvard Law School, Dan was a prominent malpractice attorney and he was earning upwards of $1 million a year. Betty was a stay-at-home mom, so they were regular guests at the um, in-crowd parties in La Jolla. Now, before we move forward, I think maybe we should share a few things about Dan and Betty's early years together. I think we should, yeah. I think we need to put it in perspective. Dan and Betty were married in 1969 in an elaborate ceremony at the Immaculate Conception Church near Betty's parents' home. Betty was a tall, beautiful blonde. Dan was a handsome, well-dressed guy. Seems like a perfect couple. But according to later interviews with Betty, Dan stopped paying attention to her even before the honeymoon ended. She said she immediately felt trapped. Mm, That's not good. It's an ominous sign, not even getting through the honeymoon. Yeah, that's never good. So when Dan decided to continue his education with the goal of becoming a malpractice attorney, Betty supported him. She worked and gave birth to their daughters, Kim and Lee, in 1970 and 1973. So Dan went to Harvard Law, got his degree, and joined a prestigious law firm in San Diego. Mm. Within a few years, he became known as the preeminent plaintiff lawyer in the field of malpractice medical, uh, in the field of medical malpractice. So here we have this guy who's going to med school and law school, and he becomes a plaintiff's attorney. Right. What do you think of that? Well, you're asking the wrong person, because I'm a doctor, and you know what doctors feel like about uh, malpractice litigators. Yeah. We kind of loathe them. Okay. But, Tell us how you really feel. Okay. <laughs> I haven't even touched that one. But anyway, so he he became a plaintiff's attorney, was hitting the big bucks. As you mentioned, he was drawing a million or more dollars a year, Uh, did quite well. So his income solved the the Broderick's financial concerns. Now that he's through school, he's established himself, he's making the money. Right. When Daniel IV was born in 1976... Looks like they have a three-year plan here. One child every three years. 
Yeah, you're right. I didn't see. It. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's right. funny. When the third one was born in 1976, the Brodericks lived in a nice house. They had a swimming pool uh, that was put in in 1978 after Dan had become successful with his own law practice. I, I probably should mention that after a while he uh, left his firm and struck out on his own. Yeah. And. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't seem to miss the big firm any. He was an immediate success as a solo practitioner. Yes, he was. And then in the meantime, one more child in 1979. That was Rhett. And they were living the large life. They joined the La Jolla Country Club. They brought a ski condominium in Keystone, Colorado. They took cruises, ski vacations, trips. They went to Europe, went all over. It looked like Betty finally had the perfect life. But... Betty's children say that the family's financial success didn't bring peace. Betty was often angry, felt unloved and ignored by Dan, and there were plenty of fights, according to the kids. That's what I've heard, yes. Now, according to Dan's brother, Larry, Betty threatened to leave Dan at least a hundred times during their marriage. It's a lot. That is a lot, yeah. <laughs> it's probably some exaggeration there, but it sounds like that... Uh, she frequently told Dan she was leaving. Sounds like it, yes. Dan's usual response to these threats was to retreat from her by working more, you know, effectively tuning her out. Yeah, I've seen that happen with a lot of marriages where they just um, don't get along and they both kind of bury themselves in their work and other things and grow further apart. For sure. You and I know a few marriages like that. We do. We won't name them right now, though. No, <laughs> I wouldn't even think of naming them. <laughs> and it was a, so it was a distant relationship. And then it was in 1983 that Dan hired an assistant, Linda Kokina. Now, Betty would later say that this was the beginning of the end for them. 22-year-old Linda Kokina had caught Dan's eye. She hadn't been to college and she couldn't type, but just a few months after she became the receptionist, he made her his legal assistant. Well, there's a few red flags there. You think so? I think. Here's, here's this person who's undereducated, it would seem, and she gets to be the legal secretary to the boss, the right. big boss. Right. So I think there's a few red flags for old Betty here. Yeah, you're probably right. And at first, Betty said she was happy that he'd hired an assistant because maybe he'd be home more and maybe the marriage would get better. But obviously things didn't work out that way. No, maybe she wasn't aware of his relationship with the uh, new assistant. Probably not. Well, it sounds like things were pretty far gone by that point anyway. I think so, yeah. I mean, he had his work, uh, which kept him busy. And she had the house and the kids. It sounds like even though they were in the same house, they were kind of leading separate lives and not paying much attention to each other. Yeah, but I don't think she was satisfied with that. He might have been okay living that way, but... I don't think she was happy that way. No, apparently not. And it was about a month later that on vacation in New York City, Dan told Betty he didn't love her anymore. In fact, according to Betty, he said he hated her. She was fat and stupid and all the horrible things that she said he said about her over and over. And when he came home a few weeks later with a new red Corvette, Betty thought, well, this is a midlife crisis. She went out and bought books on how a marriage can survive a midlife crisis, and just hoped that it would pass and things would get better. So that sounds like she was trying to hold the marriage together, getting these self-help books. Yes, it uh, does. <laughs> and, you know, trying to work on the marriage, although other reports suggest otherwise, that she's constantly threatening to leave him and stuff. So I'm not sure where that's all going. I think that these threats to leave the marriage were probably more threats to get his attention and to get things to change. Obviously, she didn't really want to leave, or she probably would have. Probably. But we have a lot more to discuss. Yeah. She wanted to save the relationship, her friends and family say. And she told the story of Dan's 39th birthday, when she made a surprise visit to his office, and she found the remains of a party there. She found champagne glasses, a partially eaten chocolate mousse cake, balloons, and when she went to ask the receptionist, the receptionist said that Dan had been gone all day with his assistant. 
So Betty waited, and Dan didn't return. Aha. Uh -huh. The plot thickens. It looks like he's really having an affair with his legal secretary. Yes, so I think this is when Betty really knew that there was an affair. She went home, and she piled Dan's custom-made clothing in a heap in the yard and set them on fire as their children sat and watched. And when Dan finally did come home that night, she met him at the door with his checkbook in her hand. She gave it to him, and she said, you're out of here. Now, he didn't leave. And in 1998, regarding this incident, Betty wrote, I can't imagine what I could have done, short of shooting him, that would have been a stronger statement on my feelings on this. Those sound like prophetic words. I, I probably should have shot him. Or, I, what was it? I, I don't know how I could have made it more clear, short of shooting him. Something like that. That's, that paraphrases it pretty yeah. well. Yeah, wow. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> so... This was before, this was a year before she did the shooting that she said that. Right. Yeah. So Dan didn't leave that day, as I said, and his, Dan's brother Larry, he said that his brother's Catholic upbringing made it difficult for him to give up on his marriage. But Betty saw it another way. She thought that Dan had just been buying his time. And that he was plotting his legal strategy in his case against her, his divorce case. I figure both of those are valid viewpoints. I think so. Sure. Now, it was in February of 1985 that Dan actually did move out, and on Easter, Betty left the children on Dan's doorstep. She said she wanted to see, she wanted Dan to see how difficult parenting is, so she took the kids, drove them to his house. He wasn't home, but she left them on the doorstep with their bags, and the children were crying, didn't want to be left there. Yeah, these are four young kids. Yeah, some of them are young. There were a couple teenagers, and I think the other ones were... Pretty young, yeah, five and six, maybe, five and seven. So the boys definitely were very young. Well, yeah, the boys were, and I, I mean, the girls were teens or early teens, but they were all still pretty young. I think that's a crappy thing to do, is just drop them off and leave. Absolutely, and, and, yeah. And she didn't make sure that they were safe or anything. She just left them. Well, that's horrible at any age, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying safety-wise, the girls were probably old enough to be safe, but not the little boys. So it was that June that Betty went to Dan's house and she trashed his bedroom. She shattered the mirrors and she spray painted the walls, including the stone fireplace and the curtains. She went a little crazy. A little crazy? I think a lot crazy. <laughs> and in September, Dan filed for divorce. Now it was that fall that Betty returned to the house twice, the first time smearing a cream pie from the refrigerator all over the master bedroom. And then throwing two wine bottles through two windows. And the second time, she smashed a sliding glass door, which is no small feat. Those things have heavy-duty glass. They do. I don't know what she used as a weapon or as a tool to do that, but... Did Dan ever call the police about these incidents? I mean, this is pretty uh, heavy-duty vandalism. Yeah, well, at that point, he did get a restraining order, but she immediately violated it, swinging an umbrella through a large picture window of his house. And this is when Dan filed criminal contempt charges against Betty. But that didn't make anything better. Things continued to get worse. Sounds like Betty's doing everything in her power to make Dan's life hell. It sure does. And he still has the kids with him? Yes, he had the kids at that point. And what about his girlfriend? Is she living with him? Yeah, we'll get to that. They started seeing each other. Yeah, in the open. They started seeing each other, you know, officially out in front of people. <laughs> But in February of 86, that's when Dan sold the house that Betty was in. And although he bought her another home in La Jolla Shores for $650,000, Betty was still furious. And when she found out, she drove to Dan's home. And when he told her to get off the property, she drove her, it was one of those Chevy. It was a Suburban. Remember those? Those were huge vehicles. Yeah, they were big, huge vehicles, for sure. I mean, it looked like you could haul a football team around in them. It could certainly do some damage. Yeah, she drove that Suburban right into the front door, knocking, like, pillars over and causing some huge damage to the house. Of course, the kids were there and saw that, too. And then in court documents, Dan declared that he had opened the car door to pull Betty out at that point, and she reached for a large butcher knife that was under her seat, the seat of her car. So the signs are there that... This woman's going to kill him, I think. Well, from what you've been saying, 
uh, about all these things going on, it certainly seems like she's mentally ill and means to do harm to Dan. Absolutely. Now, he restrained her at that point until the police arrived, and Betty spent three days at that point in the San Diego County Mental Health Hospital. Dan and his attorney went to court to make the divorce final that July of 86. Now, Betty had no lawyer, and she actually claimed that she couldn't get a qualified lawyer to represent her because no attorneys in the area would oppose Dan. Now, eventually, Betty would hire and fire five attorneys throughout the divorce proceedings. Dan got sole custody of the children with no visitation rights for Betty at that point. But according to Betty, there was never a custody hearing, and Dan and the judge had just cut a deal behind her back, giving him sole custody of the children. I don't know how that's possible, but it can't be supported or refuted because the divorce records were sealed at that point. Well, that sounds a little on the far-fetched side. You're trying to invoke a conspiracy between Dan and the judge to uh, prevent Betty from having custody or visitation with the children. But if it happened, she certainly had reason to be angry. Not reason to kill him, but reason to be angry. Yes, if it happened. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to me at this point that they wouldn't give rights to Betty until she got some mental health help. She certainly isn't fit to be around the children in the state she's in. She's already shown that she was willing to use them. That's correct. I mean, they were pawns in the battle between Betty and Dan. Well, I mean, just dropping them off at his house on the doorstep without any regard to their safety. Yeah, that wasn't cool. Right. She just left them without any regard to what was going to happen to them. Yes. She was definitely angry and probably obsessed. Her language became very crude, and she had obscene nicknames for Linda and Dan, because Dan and Linda were openly seeing each other at that point in 86. And that's when she started leaving frequent messages on his answering machine that Dan would record. So Dan came up with what I think is a very novel idea uh, to hopefully discourage some of the things that Betty was doing to him. Mm-hmm. So he began to withhold money from her... Um, alimony? Not, not al- it was it alimony? Yeah. They weren't divorced yet. Her... Um, her payments that allowance? he... Allowance? No, I don't want to say allowance either. Okay. <laughs> it's not her an money. allowance. Okay. The money he was paying her. Okay. So he, he started withholding $100 for every obscene word Betty used that uh, was left on their answering machine. Okay. He withheld $250 for each time she was on his property uninvited. Wow. $500 for every entry into his house when she was uninvited. And a thousand dollars for every time she took one of the children without his knowledge. No, but wasn't weren't these things she wasn't supposed to be doing anyway? They were, but she was ignoring them routinely. And instead of calling the police, he just decided to keep her money. He decided that one way to get her to um, adhere to the conditions was to withhold money. Okay. But it probably didn't work. It just pissed her off even more. Oh, yeah, it really did. So Betty, uh, besides being upset and unhappy and really mad at Dan, uh, she claimed that Linda, Dan's girlfriend, fiancé, whatever she is at this point, taunted her also. She claims that she received a photo of Linda and Dan in the mail with an anonymous note, Eat your heart out, bitch. Oh, that's not nice. A little harsh. And then Betty's daughter, Kim, uh, also said that Linda refused to return Betty's wedding china to her. Now, both of these things are disputed by friends of Linda and Dan. Of course. Um, And, you know, maybe the eat your heart out bitch in the heat of the moment, but I don't see why Linda would refuse to return the wedding china. Well, Betty's daughter said it was true, and she wasn't really on Betty's side. Yeah. But anyway, the friends of Dan and Linda said that they weren't capable of the cruelty that Betty was alleging. They say that Linda uh, really changed Dan and made him uh, more lovable. Is that a good thing to say? Uh, but just softening his rough edges. Yeah, a kinder, gentler Dan. A kinder, gentler Dan. And uh, Dan and Linda became engaged in June of 1988. Now, Betty claimed that Dan and Linda were ruining her children as well. 
as custody and support battles dragged on because they continued to battle in court. Their younger daughter, Lee, dropped out of high school, and then Dan later disowned her and wrote her out of his will. Now, he had asked Kim to move out when she was 18, but eventually relented and did pay for her to go to college, so I'm not sure of the circumstances here with the girls. Because it didn't seem like the girls were thoroughly on Betty's side, it seemed like they were trying to stay neutral, but... I don't know what was going on in the home that Dan decided to do those right. things. It sounds to me like Dan's thinking his daughters aren't aligned with him. Maybe, yeah. Now, the two boys, they were younger, and they were staying in frequent phone contact with Betty. They were pretty close to her. You know, she had stayed home with them right. the entire time. And when Dan and Linda were married, Dan actually hired undercover security guards and Linda, she requested that he wear a bulletproof vest also, but he refused to do that. A bulletproof vest at the wedding? That would probably be a first. Yeah, they got married on the front lawn of the home, and there was fear by a lot of people that Betty would show up and make a scene. I can see the concern, given everything that had been going on. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised she didn't. Well, maybe she didn't know. Well, maybe, but I'm sure the children were involved in the wedding. Yep. Well, then maybe some part of her brain figured that wasn't a really good idea to disrupt the wedding. Yeah. Well, a lot of Dan's friends thought he didn't take it seriously enough. He told his friends that he doubted Betty would kill her golden goose as he was paying her bills. But Linda wasn't so sure about that. She was nervous. And then Ned Huntington, a friend of Dan's who succeeded him as the president of the county bar, he said that... She was the mother of his children, and he didn't want the guilt of being continually punitive toward her. So, in fact, many of them said that um, Dan let Betty get away with a lot of atrocious acts because he didn't want to be calling the police on her. So you have divergent views on both parties, both Dan and Betty. Yeah, you really do. I mean, we've got some things that show that Betty can be capable of kindness, uh, at the same time being extremely cruel and vindictive. And we have Dan, who's also portrayed usually as a, a pretty even-tempered person. Well, uh, by his friends and family. By his friends. And also, at the same time, being a, a very angry person. Yeah, a heartless bastard, according to Betty. According to Betty. Yeah, and that's how people saw it, probably. It doesn't mean that anyone was lying. I think everybody sees it their own way and remembers it their own way. Of course. Mm -hmm. So Sharon Blanchett, um, Linda's friend, prompted Linda to ask Dan if Betty's parents could help her. Now, Sharon saw that Betty was a woman in distress and probably needed some help. She told Amy Wallace of the LA Times in an article in 1990 that they should have come and taken her away and helped ease her pain. She also said, if I ever see Betty's parents, I will go up to them and I will say, where were you? Was Betty receiving any psychiatric help during all this stuff? No, no. That was never an option or made available to her? I'm sure it was an option, but it you didn't would, happen. You would think that all the times the police had been called and uh, either arrested her or questioned her, that uh, someone would have said, this woman needs psychiatric help. And I think, um, was it after she crashed her car into the house that uh, she was in a psychiatric ward for evaluation? So nothing ever came of all that. Yes, she was. And I would think, I have no evidence or proof, but I would definitely think that people had mentioned to her and to people around her that Betty really needs some therapy. Well, it's easy to say in retrospect that uh, she needed psychiatric help. But but her parents didn't seem to really get involved and come in and help her at all. No. Now, court testimony from Betty's criminal trials show that when Betty's parents learned that their daughter was put in the mental hospital that time after she crashed the car into Dan's door, they actually cut their visit to California short. They'd been there and boarded the next plane home to New York. So they were at the house visiting at that time. And this happened. Betty was put in the mental hospital, and they just left. They didn't, you know, go to take care of their grandchildren. They didn't go to support Betty. Nothing. So that just goes to show most of these things do, you know, they're not coming from a vacuum. No. 
I mean, those, those parents don't sound like very good role models or very helpful to Betty. People come from these backgrounds that influence them, for sure. Absolutely. And they actually have not been back to see their daughter or grandchildren at all up to this point. And that's a long time now. Yes, they're basically out of touch with them. I mean, she's been in prison since when? Oh, gosh, the early 90s. Over 20 years. Yeah. And during this time, her parents haven't contacted her or their grandkids. Well, not that we know of. The last interview that I was able to find with Betty was in 2014, and that was the case. So, a wow. couple years ago. And I don't imagine anything has changed in the past couple years. Well, probably not. Now, when Betty called her parents and asked them to come to San Diego for her criminal trial, they wouldn't come. They didn't want anything to do with it, Betty told her attorney. It's too far off their scope of experience. It's off, you know, fortunately it's not in most people's scope of experience, but I don't know why they wouldn't be here, be there to support their daughter. Now, Betty was once quoted as saying, my mother is a peach. If you called her home at midnight and you had a flat tire, she'd lie in bed and she'd have people bring her tea and crumpets while she worried about you. And you'd still be on the freeway. <laughs> So I think that that kind of would really sum up her personality, if that's true. Yeah, it's a good description of how she was raised. Now, one thing many people don't know about Betty, when you hear about this case or watch the movies or whatever, because there were two Lifetime movies, not just one, but two, with Meredith Baxter Burney. That's right. And we know how useful a source of information Lifetime movies are. And most people don't know that Betty, she had a boyfriend for several months, maybe even years, prior to the murders of Dan and Linda. So it's not like she was alone, as you would have thought. In fact, um, her boyfriend Brad and Betty, they ate dinner and they slept together frequently for a few years. And at 7.30 on the morning of the murders, Brad was in bed at Betty's home. And he was awakened by the telephone. Betty's friend Diane Black was on the phone, and he, she told him, Betty just called and said she'd shot at Dan. She had considered committing suicide, but she ran out of bullets, Black told him. Now, Brad contacted a neighbor, a longtime friend of Dan's, and together they hurried to the Marston Hills home, rushed into the bedroom, and found the blood-covered bodies. So a neighbor of Dan and Linda's, as well as the ex-wife's lover or boyfriend or whatever he was, these are the two people that discovered the bodies. Well, Betty claims that he wasn't a lover. During about four years when Betty and Brad knew each other, their lives had become increasingly intertwined, and she said that he did the boy jobs, I did the girl jobs, describing how she kept a list on her refrigerator of tasks that Brad needed to do, and the week before the killings, they'd returned from a trip to Acapulco together, and they often slept in the same bed, yet she denies Brad's claim that they were intimate. Okay. It sounds to me like an intimate relationship. It does. She said, though, that I'm not the kind of person to be with someone and not be married. And she also noted that Brad was six years her junior. She said, I never brought Brad anywhere as my date because he was too young. I didn't want to be the other half of the midlife joke. She said, um, when he slept over, it was like having a dog, but he was house trained. Yeah, I mean, that just is totally unbelievable. Yeah. Well, and it really seems like she's so concerned about what people think above all else. That's... That's really something. If that's all true. I mean, it sounds to me like she was inst intimate with him, and is just denying it for whatever reason. Yes, but if she was intimate him with him, why was she still so angry and obsessed with Dan? It's almost like she couldn't take the rejection. Well, I don't see that as any kind of anomaly. I mean, she could still be intimate with a guy, whether she admits to it or not, and still absolutely loathe her ex-husband. Well, sure, but when I... Before I'd done any research on this case, I'd always thought that Betty was without a man. Yeah. I think that was what most people assumed, the way she was obsessed and stalking. But that doesn't preclude her from her doing husband. what she did. Well, obviously mm -hmm. it doesn't, right? Now, her oldest daughter, Kim, and her other daughter, Lee, they said they often confronted their mother about the relationship. Once, after Lee walked in on the couple in the shower... Kim asked her mother how could she be so mad at Dan and Linda when she had Brad for herself. And Betty told her daughter, how can you equate the two? Brad doesn't support me. Seems like she's got some skewed ideas on relationships. For sure. 
Kim said Mom would never admit that she'd ever had a happy life. That would be admitting that she could get on with herself and that Dan didn't ruin her life, something she would not do. No. No. So on the Friday before the murders, there were legal papers that were served to Betty. And these were regarding the lewd messages that she left on the home answering machine. And late that Saturday night, she said, you know, the threats just kept pounding like hammers in my head. I couldn't sleep. So it was just before dawn on Sunday when she got up, got dressed, got in her car, and drove from her Ocean View home to Dan and Linda's Georgian-style home in Marston Hills. Now, she used her daughter's key to let herself in. She went upstairs and into the master bedroom. She was standing over the bed where Dan and Linda slept. Now, as her eyes were adjusting to the darkness, she pointed her two-year-old 38 caliber five-shot revolver toward the bed and began firing. One bullet went into the wall. One bullet hit a bedside table, but three of the bullets did hit the sleeping couple. One went into Linda's neck and lodged in her brain. Another hit Linda in the chest. The third bullet entered Dan's back, fracturing a rib and tearing into his right lung. According to Betty, Dan said, okay, okay, you got me, and he dove to the floor, landing near the bedside telephone. Betty says that she thought, oh my God, he's going to be on the phone before I get down the stairs, and she yanked the phone out of the wall and left. Now, this is one of many stories. She's also told the story that she doesn't remember pulling the phone out. But the phone was pulled out. Yes. And she went over to the house with a gun in her purse. Yes, she said that she just wanted them. Well, there's separate stories. One time, well, not one time, but many times, she said that she just brought the gun to make them talk to her to get their attention. And then at other times, she said it was to commit suicide in front of them. And she even said some really horrifying things like, you know, splattering her brains on their bed. Just really sick things. You could also say it was a premeditated act that she had brought the gun with her with the intention of doing harm. Well, yes, I think that the prosecutor would agree with you there. Now, in the initial interviews with the police, Betty spoke intelligently, they said, with a great deal of anger and with no remorse at all, which doesn't surprise me from what I've seen. Not at all. It doesn't surprise me either. According to Betty Broderick, if Dan had just given her a fair settlement, she would have been fine. She would have had her house, her kids, and she would have still been a size six. Dan had tried to drive her insane, she said, so no one would ever blame him for the divorce. More words from Betty. <laughs> she said, my emotional outbursts were only a response to Dan's calculating, hateful way of dealing with our divorce. That's her side of the story. Yes, but she really has held on to that idea over the years, that this, right. that she was driven to it, and she really will not take responsibility, even when asked. No, she won't. She won't say she's sorry for what she did. She'll say, I'm sorry that happened. So the divorce settlement was signed off by her and or her attorney. So I would assume that at least at some point it was acceptable to her. It might have been legally acceptable, but I don't think that it was acceptable to her emotionally. Just the idea that he left her, I don't think she ever accepted that. No, but I think one of the things that was mentioned previously was that she didn't think she had enough money or received enough money in the divorce settlement. Yes, she did say that. But her attorney thought otherwise, because they signed off on it. Yes, and at other times she said it didn't have anything to do with the money. It was yeah. about the custody. Yeah. Now, an interesting thing is that soon after Betty's story went public, hundreds of people, mostly women, said that they understood the fury that prompted Betty's actions. Well, I, I can certainly see the um, anger at the ex, and uh, maybe you wish all sorts of ill will towards that person, but I can't believe that they are condoning her killing her ex-husband and his wife. I know we all get mad at our exes. I, I have done that myself, but we're not going to kill them. Well, most people don't, fortunately. Not hardly any of them do. Now, one of the women wrote to Betty when she was in jail, and she said, I'm surprised you didn't kill them sooner. I believe Dan and Linda were trying to drive you to commit suicide. So that's one woman. Another example is someone who wrote, I believe everything you said because I've been there. Lawyers and judges refuse to protect mothers against legalized emotional terrorism. Now, although most of these women did not condone the murder, 
they said that many of her actions were justified. And Betty herself insisted that she'd been Dan's victim and that everything she did was justified. She said, I was right. How could things go so wrong? <laughs> I like how they say the murders were justified, but they don't condone the murders. I mean, that's a pretty fine line. And it, it seems like they're essentially the same argument. Yes. Yeah. Well, to Betty, hers was the story of a loving wife and mother who was abused, dumped, and driven to violence by the man that she'd invested her whole life in. Now, she said that she bought into a 1950s Leave it to Beaver marriage, and he stole her whole life. She said this was a desperate act of self-defense. Now, her defense at trial was that she'd never planned to kill Dan and Linda, and at her second trial, she claimed that she was startled by Linda screaming, call the police. Now, she hadn't mentioned that earlier, but in this story, Linda said call the police as soon as she walked in the room, and the gun accidentally started going off. Just by accident. And she can't remember any of it. Now, Broderick was represented at the trial by criminal defense attorney Jack Early, and Carrie Wells was the prosecutor for the state of California. Now, Early told jurors that Betty was a battered wife driven over the edge by years of psychological, physical, and mental abuse by her ex-husband. Wells described Broderick as a murderer who planned and schemed to kill her ex-husband and his wife. Betty Broderick, Wells told the juror, had been getting $16,000 a month in alimony, living in the $650,000 home on the beach, had two cars, a boyfriend, and at that time her two young sons had moved in with her. Now, in the trial, Dr. Park Diaz for the prosecution used the analysis of Dr. Melvin Goldspan to show Betty's mental state, and I believe you did some research on the um, psychiatric evaluations. That I did. So in the two trials, there were um, psychiatrists and psychologists who testified for both the prosecution and the defense. In okay. the first trial, Dr. Melvin Goldsbond was the prosecutor's witness, and Catherine DeFrancesca was the expert witness for the defense. Second trial, Dr. Park Elliott Dietz was for the prosecution, and the same Catherine DeFrancesca was for the defense. So, and their diagnoses are pretty much the same. They felt that she suffered from a personality disorder with narcissistic tendencies and histrionic tendencies. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all from the footage I've seen. No. And the defense also felt that she was severely depressed, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit. I would believe that, yeah. But the personality disorder is a mental disorder that's characterized by emotional instability, feelings of worthlessness, insecurity, impulsivity, and impaired social relationships. Kind of fits Betty to a T. I would, I would say so, yeah. There's apparently over 3 million people uh, diagnosed with this in the United States per year. Wow. Uh, it's something that can't really be cured. No, no. Uh, talk therapy is most effective. And uh, there's been some use of mood-stabilizing medications, but they haven't been proven to be much of any use. So the, the subgroups or the, the subheadings of um, narcissism and histrionic behaviors, narcissism, a uh, long-standing pattern of grandiosity, an overwhelming need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. Again, that sounds like Betty. Then the histrionic aspect shows, or, or the criteria for that are discomfiture, if not the center of attention, shallow and labile emotions, uh, very impressionistic and dra dramatic speech, and uh, just overestimation, overestimation, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Phew. <laughs> of the uh, level of intimacy in relationships. Ah, okay. So those are the diagnoses. Uh, and again, like I said, that the witnesses for the prosecution and the defense uh, pretty much all agreed that that's what Betty was suffering from. The major difference was that the defense felt that she was severely depressed, and this may have or, or was likely to have played a role in the shootings. Hmm. 
Okay. Now, how did the defense, did they use that as a defense that that made it, made her unaware of what she was doing or something? How did that come into play? No, it was meant to mitigate things, but it wasn't a defense. So what was her defense? That she snapped. Okay. And she didn't remember and that she was driven to it. She was driven to it. I don't know if that's ever a defense though. Well, it didn't work, did it? No. Okay. Well, um, her first trial did end with a hung jury, and that was because two jurors held out for manslaughter, citing lack of intent. So nobody was going to say not guilty in the first trial. There were two jurors who were going to say manslaughter, which I think is very generous. I do too. Yeah. Went into the house. That seems like premeditated murder. And pulled the phone out of the wall so they couldn't call for help if they were able. I don't think Linda would have been, but possibly Dan could have called for help. Well, anyway, we're going to have a second trial. Yeah, so the second trial was a year later, and she was retried with the same defense attorney, the same prosecutor, and this time the jury returned with a verdict of two counts of second-degree murder. Now, for that, she was sentenced to two consecutive terms of 15 years to life, Plus, she got two years for illegal use of a, fo a firearm, which is just funny to me. But <laughs> So I guess rules are rules, although it seems kind of self-evident. I know, but I would think any murder is illegal use of a firearm for good measure, I guess. And she's serving out her sentence at the California Institution for Women. Now, it was in January 2010 that her first request for parole was denied. Now, that was denied because she didn't show remorse or acknowledge wrongdoing, so that's no big surprise. Right. Right. You know, if there's anything we've learned from watching our crime shows on television, it's that you have to show remorse when you're up for parole. Yes, I think so. Now, Betty was also denied parole in 2011, and at that point they said she could not apply again for 15 years. Now, the 2011 parole hearing is available for viewing on YouTube. There's a part one to part two, which I did watch. And she didn't seem any different from the Betty in her murder trial in the early 90s in these. She has not grown. The parole board, you know, was trying to talk to her. They said, we're not here to retry your case because she was going over all the same stuff about how she was so tortured by them and just wanted to talk to them, mm -hmm. you know, all this. And she refused to accept responsibility. Now, she said she left the house thinking that Dan was chasing after her because she heard him speak clearly when he said, okay, okay, you've got me. And she thought that he was coming after her, and that's why she fled the house. She ended her plea with the parole board saying, my only hope is to go forward in love and peace. Good presentation. Now, part two of her parole hearing was um, when witnesses came to give their opinion okay. to testify. So who came to testify? Well, the first was um, her son, Dan Broderick, Dan Broderick IV. And he testified that his mother has not been healthy or stable for decades. And he doesn't believe that she's remorseful. So he believed that she should stay in prison. Right. And it was sad because he was tearful. You could tell he didn't want to be saying that, but that's how he felt. I mm -hmm. believe. I believed him. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the oldest daughter, who's married now, her name is Kim Piggins, and she's the oldest daughter. And she said that she's always hoped that someday her mom would come around and realize what she'd done and show remorse. But she said not once, except in front of the parole board, had her mother shown any remorse at all. She had never accepted any responsibility for what she did to their father and to their lives. And that Betty continuously maintains that she is the victim here. So there's two kids that want her to stay in prison, two of her children. Yeah. Now her daughter Lee, on the other hand, she came in crying and she said that her mother's been a good prisoner. That's really all she had to say. She didn't have much else to say about it. She sounded very upset, like she's had a rough life. She even said she's had a difficult time growing up with this, but she believes her mother's been a good prisoner and she supports her release. So was Betty getting any psychiatric help while she was in prison? So was there any therapy available to her in prison? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't believe so. And I don't believe she's made any progress from what I saw in that video. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. So we have two kids that want her granted parole and two that don't feel she should be granted parole. Right. Are there any other people that testified? Oh, sure. 
there was Dan, Dan, her, Dan, the murder victim's brother, Larry, and he was quite verbal. Well, I can guess what his opinion's going to be. Yeah. He's talked about how sad it is that the, he had lost his brother and had no, you know, no time with him over the last 20 years. Um, he was sad about what it had done to his parents. He also said he was very sad for the children, how the children were devastated by this woman's outrageous acts. But he said his overwhelming emotion was rage. He said, I have become a bitter, angry person. He also said the criminal sitting before you is a psychopath and self-centered and lying. And she should not be released. Pretty powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, this was kind of a surprise, Betty's brother, Roger, who I hadn't really heard anything about before. No, he's a new player. Where's he been? I don't know. But he, he came in to testify, and he said that he felt like the most important part of this parole hearing was, if Betty gets out, will she be safe? Will she get angry at someone and do this again? If she feels like she needs to get revenge on someone, is this something she would do again? And he says, well, no one knows and no one can know. And he said, I believe that Betty should remain confined for the rest of her life. Well, yeah, I'll bet it. Well, yes, I, I think if you ask mental health specialists uh, this question, they would say the same thing, that without therapy, uh, very intensive therapy, she'd be likely to do the same thing. Yeah, she sure seemed to have the same personality. Of, yeah. yeah. Now, the parole board did make their decision, and, of course, they said, you know, there's been no significant progress in evolving past the situation. Even more significant, what they thought, was what her own kids were saying, how she hasn't moved past it, how she really needs to move on, and how they feel like she's still back 20 years ago. Yeah. She's made no progress. And I don't really know anything about her relationship because I hadn't heard anything about that. And we still haven't heard anything from the parents. No, only what I said that I found in the yeah. L.A. Times article. They've had no contact. No, not that I know of. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, one thing I did want to talk about was these Betty Broderick supporters. Now, what is the psychological, I don't know, what is the background, what is the basis for people who are supporting her? Is it similar to people who marry prisoners? What What is it? My thinking is it's a similar situation to people that start corresponding with prisoners and end up becoming more involved with them, even romantically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they have some mental issues also. Right. <laughs> well, one thing I found were, was a Facebook page, and it was supporting Betty Broderick, and it had an address where you could write to Betty. It talked about, you know, when Betty's birthday was. I looked back on it the last couple of years' posts. It said things about Betty's birthday, about Betty liking chocolate and other things. It, it had a link to JPay so that... People could go online and send money through the prison to put in her commissary account. And it also talked a lot about how Betty was mistreated and how, for the most part, they didn't think she should have committed the murder, but how she really couldn't help it. That's just a poor excuse. <laughs> yeah. But there was, there was a group of people after this crime that actually thought that Betty was a feminist hero because she'd stood up for women that were abused and held in controlling relationships. Well, that's predicated on the assumption that Betty was an abused woman, which I think is a debatable point. In any event, I don't think feminism endorses killing people. No, even if, even if Dan had abused her in some way, he wasn't after her. She went to his house. She was harassing him. So I really think that, you know, that whole idea falls, falls away once you know the facts. Now, one thing I thought about it is, um, from a feminist viewpoint, you could look at this story and you could say, this shows us some bad, a bad side, I guess, to being dependent on a man, to not having your own, your own life, your own career, because Betty was so caught up in Dan and the money that he gave her and the social life and the material things that when he left, she really didn't have anything to fall back on. Not saying that as an excuse, but saying 
it's a good thing for women to think about when they get in a relationship about maintaining your independence. I wholeheartedly agree. And not losing your identity in the relationship. No argument there. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're kind of in agreement on that. Surprised you, didn't I? <laughs> no, I, I know you're pretty reasonable. I do wonder about the supporters. Um, I don't agree with them, but I'm sure that there's something in their life that makes it okay to them what she did or to make them feel empathy with her. Well, I can empathize with her, but I certainly can't support her. That's just a horrible crime, the killing of two people. But even the crimes before the murder were unacceptable. And the way she treated her children and what she exposed her children to, I find unacceptable. Yeah, I can say to Betty that I'm sorry she ended up the way she ended up. And I could offer any help from me that uh, she might want. Yeah, and maybe Betty didn't have anyone in her life doing that. Who knows? Right. Or maybe she did and she just didn't see it. More likely. More likely, yeah. All right. Well, I look forward to our talk next week. In the meantime, you can follow us anytime on twitter.com forward slash tigerabberpods. Our Facebook page is www.facebook.com forward slash tigerabberpodcast. And this is where we post what's coming up on our, what we're going to do for our next case, so that's a good thing to check. And we can always use more five-star reviews on iTunes. It's really the best way to encourage us to continue doing the podcast, to give us a little bit of love make us feel a little good about ourselves, right? And, you know, we'll happily share those on a future episode, on a future episode, even if they are not all praise, even if they have a little bit of constructive criticism in them. That's okay. That's okay. Now, I got some feedback from Karen Stevenson, Brenda Sue Thompson, and Amanda Lynn. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening and for taking the time to write to us. Karen and Amanda Lynn actually sent us some ideas for cases to cover, and I just want to let you two know that I'm going to check into those, and we might end up doing one of those. So I appreciate your input. And I also want to say, don't forget, on our website, there's a voicemail button on the right side. Our website is www.tigrabber.com. Now, if you just click on this voicemail button, you can share opinions on cases we've done or ideas for future ones in your own voice. Now, I personally can get a little tired of hearing myself, and sometimes my mouth gets a little tired, a little dry, a little fatigued. So if you leave a voicemail, that way I can play it on the future episode in your voice, and it really helps me out in that respect. Dick is also taking beer recommendations. I just want to let you know, though, he's very picky, so I can't guarantee anything. But if you do recommend a beer that he thinks is something worthy of reviewing on the show, he would definitely do that. And what we're doing with our donation subscription on our website is we're going to create three levels. We just haven't figured out what we're going to have for rewards for each level, if you want to go ahead and join. And as you probably already know, True Crime Brewery is available on iTunes, and it's available on Stitcher and Google Play as well. So I hope that you enjoyed tonight's episode, and I hope you'll meet back with us again. At the quiet end of the bar. Yep. Where we'll sip a fine beer. So we will see you at the quiet end of the bar next time. Bye-bye. Goodbye. -bye. Goodbye.